This means, of course, you'll be able to shoot the turkey and stuff it at the same time. <laughs> they finished up sitting at those two desks and it became absolute institution. News has just come in that Sussex firemen have freed the drunken bell ringer who forgot to let go of the rope during the carol service and caught his ding-dong merrily on high. <laughs> Hundreds of people wrote in jokes every week, lists and lists of jokes, and one day a week we would read perhaps six or seven or eight pages of jokes. And when it was all over, we both looked, and if we'd both ticked one, that joke was in. And we weren't allowed to laugh at them, you know, with this little rule we had, because we felt it gave the joke an added quality that it may not possess if we giggled at it. Latest statistics show that 90% of all British women like shaking Stevens. <laughs> On the other hand, 90% of all British men think he's old enough to shake himself. <laughs> we had done all sorts of work, and we were so... Um, conscious, so properly aware of our skills and our limitations, that we sat down and on paper worked out what would be the proper showcase for our various uh, uh, skills. Peter, don't stand there all on your own. <laughs> and Hamish! <laughs> The two Ronnies, in essence, weren't a double act, but they were always associated together by the public. Um, Ronnie Barker was the actor uh, who was good at comedy, to say the least, and Ronnie Corbett was a comic who was a pretty good actor, and they sort of met in the middle. So tell me, which town in Scotland do you uh, come from, uh, you know? Air, I suppose, is it? <laughs> air? Why do you mention air? What's so special about air? Well, nothing, nothing, nothing particularly. Like, you know, just a very nice town, air. You know, I understand. It grows on you. I do not come from air. I come from somewhere quite different. Oh, really? Where? Wigton in Wigton. <laughs> the two Ronnies employed a team of writers, but one mystery figure began to supply more and more top-notch material. We got in the post some stuff from this man called Gerald Wiley. Everybody said, this is, this is really good. We must... Um, have more material from this man. We got his agent on the phone, or a woman who lived over the road. There was, there was something mysterious about Gerald Wiley. When I get up to heaven, they'll say, out of all this mess, you've saved an ordinary man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, save, save what, sir? An ordinary man. Yes, sir, I will. You will what? As soon as I get back to the mess, sir, I'll save you a strawberry plant. <laughs> People began to suspect that perhaps this was David Frost writing sketches, because this Gerald Wiley seemed to know the business pretty well. Tom Stoppard, who was with the agent in question, somebody thought this is Stoppard moonlighting and everything. Finally, the whole two Ronnie's team gathered in a restaurant and invited the mysterious Gerald Wiley to join them, but they were in for a surprise. I had to stand up and say, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, that, that it was me. I wrote them, I am Gerald Wiley. Yeah. And the voice from the back, Barry Cryer, yeah. said, nobody loves a smart ass." and that was the end of it. And I think he perhaps subsequently regretted telling us all so early because it, it was a wonderful device for him to hide behind, you know. So how are you, but You know what? Nice and grumble. Oh, yeah, nice and grumble. I just thought I'd pop in on my way up to... Uh, what, up the off licence? No, up to... Uh, <laughs> to what? Alcoholics Anonymous? <laughs> <laughs> no, up to uh, the dance match, you know, oh, up the club. Oh, a dance match, yeah. yeah. Oh, thanks, Charlie. Hey, Charlie. Well, cheers. Merry cheers. Christmas. Well, Merry Christmas. The Do Ronnies were a writer's dream. They were a writer's dream in that they loved words. You could tell that from the way they relished those, you know, clever word things. Mind you, the beer... Beer was flowing like there was no uh, no whiskey left. <laughs> no, no tomorrow. Oh, no tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Whenever they dressed up as women, I found that you know like cool because that was kind of maybe the first time I'd seen men dress up as women and it just the uh, you know because Ronnie Barker is a bruiser. Hated, hated it. My wife hated it. She couldn't bear to see me in the drag. I didn't like it. No. But people, it was so popular. That doctor did something for Harry that not many doctors would do. What's that? Yeah. Well, he treated him for a double hernia and he only charged him for the one. <laughs> well, Ronnie always claims that he was unhappy in it or, or his, that his wife didn't like seeing him in it. Uh, but I didn't mind it at all because, because I'd been very much kind of brought up under the wing of Dan and Rue, so I was quite used to knowing how to dress up properly and be a, a little lady. Ronnie Corbett, it was quite simple because he was very, had a very neat figure, wonderful pair of legs, 
so it was uh, just a padded bra and uh, a nipped in waist, and he looked fine. <laughs> He always looked just like his mother. Always made me laugh. Always made me laugh. As soon as he, whatever he was, he came out and I said, Oh, you should look just like your mother again. Ronnie Barker was, it was a sturdy corset and a specially built bra. Ronnie Barker said he didn't enjoy doing drag, but in fact, when the costume was pulled together and it was, I'd feminized it as much as, as I could, he was marvelous. For two bucks a shot, only two bucks a shot, I show them what's what and what's where. The 1997 Christmas show would have a special significance in the two running story. Ronnie Barker had confided in his comedy partner that it would be his last show, but no one else on the program knew of his decision. I, I'd completely dried up writing wise. And I said to Ronnie, it's um it can't go on forever, this. The series would go out on a high note, though, and was dominated by a lavish spoof of Binocchio. We built this whole chalet scenario with lakes at Ealing Film Studios. It was fantastic. It was a proper little chalet, and inside with all the working toys and dolls, and outside it was all like rolling fields and bridges. I dread to think what it cost. What sort of poncy clobber do you call this? <laughs> Honestly, I look like something out of a Tyrolean knocking shop. <laughs> this cannot be. You can't talk and walk. I haven't put the key in your back yet. Get in my back. You're trying to wind me up or something. <laughs> we filmed the Pinocchio thing, proper filming at Ealing, you know, uh, so it already had taken on different proportions because Ealing had all this history of the Ealing comedy, so we were in proper film studios. I wonder if they had this trouble with the flower pot men. <laughs> that would be the last show that Ronnie ever did. <laughs> One egg over easy. Oh, I forgot you took the vow of silence. Yeah, you, bomb aid. In a minute, I'm taking holy orders. It was the kind of epic feel to these little films that was so exciting. And it was the fact that they, they really did shoot them as though they were straight feature films. You're all made completely from bits of wood. Where did you come from? Well, I didn't come from flaming MFI, did I? <laughs> bitch! Are you sure you're not just after my body? Of course not. <laughs> Are you sure you're not just after my soft, golden thighs and firm, pulsating bosom? Never. He'd lost his appetite and he wasn't feeling wonderful, I don't think, either, really. But I thought it was sad, you know, because there was so much life in us still and probably life in the programme. But as it turned out, it probably came to a timely end. You know, Gretchen, this may sound corny, but you've made a happy man very old. <laughs> when it had finished, I went back onto the set to get something I'd left there, I don't know what. And I was walking back and walking right through the set and over this little rustic bridge and I thought, this is the last time ever I'm going to be in a studio like this and doing this sort of thing. And I, yes, it was very poignant. A few tears in my eyes. <laughs> and finally, a message for the ladies. If an old gentleman with a long white beard tucked something in your stocking last night, it was Father Christmas. <laughs> if it happens again tonight, you've been goosed by a Chelsea pensioner. <laughs> Until then, it's a Merry Christmas from me. And a Happy New Year from him. Good night. Good night. The last show the two Ronnies did, the 1987 Christmas special, was an absolute landmark because it marked the end of an era, the end of those big production shows, the institutions, Eric and Ernie, two Ronnies. We will never see that like again. With the two Ronnies saying goodbye for the last time, an era of classic comedy came to an end. But the BBC had already rolled out its new weapon in the ratings war, the sitcom Christmas special.